Well, this study uh, done by Chris Kaiba and uh, and his graduate student uh, actually found that we have a 9.6% increase per year in the level of light pollution. Uh, and that was uh, because um, there was a study using the Globe at Night data, which is this uh, citizen science data, uh, data or program that um, allows people to rate the night sky very simply by just using their eyes and um, and uh, taking measurements uh, whenever they want to each month, uh, usually 10 days each month. We looked at how many stars people report they see and what we found is that year after year, the number of stars people say that they're able to see has been decreasing. Uh, we're able to um, use an analysis to try and figure out how we could explain that by an increase in sky brightness. And we found that uh, globally across all the observers, if the sky was increasing at about 9.6% per year, that would explain this loss of stars. Sky brightness is a sign that we're doing lighting wrong. Um, it's possible to light up cities in ways that don't produce so much sky brightness. So when we see a lot of brightness in the sky, it's a sign we're using energy inefficiently and we're spending more money on light than we need to. So when this light goes up into the sky and we see that it's getting brighter and brighter, that's basically money that we're paying to produce this light in the sky that not only makes the stars disappear, uh, it also means that any environmental impacts that you have, for example, from migrating birds crashing into buildings are becoming more frequent, right? Because we're putting more lights up and causing those environmental impacts to happen more often. There is a, an irreplaceable awe that the natural night sky, you know, a sky with, uh, without any light pollution uh, provides. And it inspires you and it connects you uh, to all the wonders uh, the cosmos holds. And if that source of inspiration is diminished by a washed out light polluted sky, then we are losing part of ourselves and what we can strive to be. So the study is based on people going outside at night and looking at the stars and comparing what they see to a set of maps that show the sky under different levels of light pollution. It is so, so simple. Uh, anyone from age eight to 80 can do it, or even beyond. <laughs> uh, you go out, you try to get your eyes dark adapted, which may take, according you know, your, to your age, as less as, as 10 minutes to maybe 20 minutes if you're older. And uh, you, you make sure that your eyes are adapted uh, so you can see uh, the sky as best as possible. And then uh, you try to use the Globe at Night. Uh, it's sort of an app where you can bring it up on your cell phone and put it in dark mode and, and uh, then compare what you see for the constellation of the month, which in January, for instance, is going to be, it is Orion right now in February and March and for the Northern Hemisphere. And you look up at Orion and you, uh, you compare what you see to about seven different images or charts. And these charts are actually show what astronomers call limiting magnitudes, but then it's um, the, the higher the number, the more stars you're gonna see, which means the less light polluted sky. What we did is we compared their responses to what we expected based on a map from 2016 that's a prediction of how bright the sky is. When we did that comparison, what we found is that for the years before 2014, which is the year that really it's based on, um, people reported seeing more stars than we would expect. And as every year went on, they reported seeing fewer stars. So that's basically the main finding. We have at, to date about 250,000 measurements all over the world in the last uh, 17 years. Uh, what Chris did was to take the last 12 years because 12 years ago, we had um, a, a, a upgrade in how we did things. We went to an app basically, and he used the 12, last 12 years. And he also wanted to take out data like uh, you know moonlight data, twilight data, um, data that was affected by clouds. And, and things like that. So you wanted to make it as normalized as possible so you can make a fair comparison. And when he did that, he noticed, and also a very, very good reason, you had to take uh, repeated measurements from the same kind of locations on a very aggregate uh, basis. So maybe like countries or areas of countries, like states in the United States. Uh, and so uh, by doing this, he was able to make a very fair comparison uh, of what was going on in those locations. and. Um, 
And uh, that's where he <laughs> kind of boiled down from 250,000 down to 51,000 or so uh, measurements. And, uh, but I still think that's a lot of measurements to make as good a conclusion as he did. And, um, and then of course I got to a, a conclusion of 9.6% uh, rise in light pollution each and every year, which is seems outstand outstanding, but there's a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, we then went in to try and work out how could we explain that decrease in stars in terms of an increase in sky brightness. And what we found is that you can explain the, the, this change over time pretty well if you assume that the sky is becoming brighter at about 10% per year. What that means in concrete terms is that uh, if you imagine a, a child is born somewhere where today you can see 250 stars, if the light was to continue to increase at the current rate, what we would see is that when that child's 18 years old, they would only be able to see 100 stars in that location. And so within one generation, this is a really big change that we're talking about. So this is uh, one of the best things you can do is simply take part, tell your friends about it, tell your family about it. And the other is don't just do it once. If you do it this year, do it again next year and do it the year after that, because you'll really help us understand how things are changing if you're making observations from the same place every year. That being said, if you've never done it before, no problem. One observation is better than none. So in my opinion, the best time to take part in Globa Night is in February because that uses the constellation Orion, which for me at least is easier to see than some of the other constellations at other times of the year. And February is also a great month to take part because that's when Valentine's Day is. We're actually very lucky that the first three months of the year have Orion as the primary constellation that's used in Globe at Night, both in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. But this year we're doing something extra special in that we're using the month of February to celebrate a theme uh, called Love the Stars. And this is something that's being hosted by IDA and also uh, Noir Lab, where Globe at Night uh, originated. So. Um, and it's going to be on February 12th through the 21st, usually always 10 days each month. And so take your honey out, take your family out, take your friends out and enjoy Valentine's Day or any day during those 10 days uh, under a night sky, hopefully full of stars.